today is a big, big day. Today is a huge day. Today is an important day. But before we get to the UK game, we need to get through <laughs> part five of the unfinished series. So uh, we're walking through the book of Philippians. If you've missed any of these messages, you can go back on our website, cpcc.church forward slash series forward slash unfinished hashtag. That's a lot of forward slashes. Or if you're just looking for resources, uh, go to cpcc.church forward slash unfinished. And there's a wealth of information there, uh, FAQs, there are small group videos uh, that I've done for our small groups. If you're not in a small group, uh, you can go back and, and watch some of those and do the questions out of the book. There are family uh, devotional videos that I did with Tammy uh, Phillips. There are, um, uh, there are stories that we've used as part of this series that we've shown on Sunday mornings. If you want to go back and watch any of those, there are small group stories. So if you're not in a small group, you've missed some of those stories, very powerful stories. So go back and, and catch uh, a lot of that uh, stuff. So uh, let me just give a quick overview of what Unfinished is. And I know some of you are like, hey man, we've heard this a thousand times, uh, but that's not true. It's been way less than a thousand. And you need to remember that every single Sunday is somebody's first Sunday in a month or it's their first Sunday ever. And so what we're talking about requires some context, especially as we move into next Sunday, which is Commitment Sunday. So this is a two-year journey that we're on as a church, uh, talking about finishing what God started here uh, 30 years ago, 29 years ago, when he gave the church the opportunity to purchase this piece of property that we're, that we're sitting on. Uh, that's what it looked like back in 1990. It looks a little different uh, today. They purchased this for a whopping price of $20,000. How many of you wish you could find 16 acres in Liberty Township? for $20,000. That was a steal. Uh, the plan then was to build in five phases on this property. We've completed four of the five phases. This initiative is about finishing out phase five, which is a brand new 1,200 seat worship center off to the east, as well as a large lobby that allows us to connect and have some community on Sunday morning. That will also be open during the week for our community. So if people want to come over here and work in our lobby, great. Uh, moms can come over and bring their kids and have some mom time, and there will be an a, a indoor playground for for the kids to, to play on. So that'll be a neat thing for our community. Uh, there'll be new and renovated children's space. There'll be a dedicated student center for our middle school and high school students. And what we're, what we're trying to do here is raise 10 million over the next two years. Five million of that is going to ongoing ministry, which is our general operating fund. So everything uh, that we need to move ministry forward here. Our current budget is just shy of 2.5 million. So multiply by two uh, over a period of two years, it's, it's 5 million. So we kind of flatlined our budget for the next uh, two years. And the other $5 million is, to, is going to renovation uh, and expansion. Now, uh, that building costs more than $5 million. And so we've got to do what uh, everybody does, almost everybody, 99% of the people, when they build a house or they buy a house, they take out a loan. And so we're partnering with the Solomon Foundation, who loans money to the churches to help them move forward in their next step of growth with uh, helping them build a building. And so they're called a church extension fund. And so the remaining balance of the building after two years will be about $7 million. But all of that depends on how much money we raise in the next two years. If we raise more, we borrow less. If we raise less, we have to borrow more. So this is totally up to us. And that's why our primary goal is not raising $10 million. Money is never the primary goal in the kingdom of God. Uh, money is never the objective. We believe that God orchestrates what he originates. He orchestrates what he originates. That God gave us this vision. We trust that God will fund this vision. And the way that God usually funds vision is through generosity uh, on our part and also through organizations like the Solomon Foundation who exist to partner with churches and help them take uh, the next step. But I will tell you, in a church our size and in a community like this, Liberty Township in Westchester, that goal should not be a problem for us. $10 million should not be a problem for us. And, uh, but our primary goal is 100% engagement, 100% engagement. So we want everybody who calls Center Point home to go on this journey uh, with us to help us finish the work. Now, if you're new to Center Point, okay, we're not asking you to go on this journey. 
We're simply glad you're here. We want you to know that we're doing this for you so that we can create more space for you and for other people uh, like you. We don't have any expectation that you'll partner with us in this uh, vision. We just hope you'll stick around. And, and if you decide to stick around and you decide to jump in with us on mission and vision, fantastic. We'd love to have you. But if Centerpoint is your church, you're like, this is where I go to church. This is my church. This is my home. We want you to go on the journey with us. We want you to be engaged. And engagement is this. It's 100% engagement and radical generosity. Generosity is one of our core values here. And we state it like this. We believe radical generosity is normal behavior for everybody who follows Jesus. We give in a way that only makes sense in light of God's grace. Now, $10 million is double our budget, but it's doable. It's double, but it's doable. Uh, when we all come together with radical and sacrificial generosity, it is doable. And God may call you to double your giving. He may call you to double, double your giving. For some of you, it's going to be the first time that you've ever given. Radical generosity looks different for everybody because everybody's circumstance is different. Engagement looks different for everybody. Engagement for your family looks different than engagement for my family. And just like you, Janelle and I have been praying through this and talking through what engagement looks like for us. And, and we believe God has given us a number that he's laid on our heart that is above and beyond what our regular giving in is. And it's going to be a stretch for us. And it should be a stretch. But it's not a have to. It's a get to. As Jesus followers, we don't give out of obligation. That's Old Testament. That's Old Testament law. Old Testament law was 10%. You're obligated to give 10% of your income. New Testament is all about grace. We don't give out of law. We give out of uh, grace. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so we give from a heart of gratitude for what God has done for us, for what the gospel has done for us. And this was the heart behind the believers in Philippi. They were financial partners with Paul in the gospel. And that's one of the key reasons that Paul writes this letter. It is really a thank you note for their partnership. He says this in chapter one, every time I thank of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy. Why? For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. You've gone all in with me. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now this verse right here, verse six, this is our anchor verse for this series. This is our anchor verse for this initiative because we believe that God always finishes what he starts. God is not done with our ministry here. He has more for us to do. God is not done with me. He has more for me to do. God is not done with you. He has more for you to do. If you're not dead, God is not done. That's the way it works. And we said, hey, we're not who we used to be, but we're not yet who we should be. We're not who we used to be thanks to the grace of God who lifted us out of the pit of sin and gave us the hope of eternal salvation. We are different. We're not who we used to be, but we're not yet who we should be. God isn't finished with us. Our faith isn't finished. Our service isn't finished. Our confidence isn't finished. We talked last week about how our peace isn't finished. And today as he ends this letter to the Philippians, he's going to talk about unfinished generosity. And he's going to give us the secret to how to live a radically generous life. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now, I have not known extreme poverty in my life. Nor have I known extreme prosperity as it relates to Americanized prosperity. My family is not going hungry, but we're not traveling the world Either I have no idea how to identify with the hardships of Paul. I don't know how to identify with the prosperity of Warren Buffett. 
Okay, so maybe you can identify with me. Most of us are playing in similar size sandboxes, some, some a little smaller, some a little bigger, but most of us similar size. And, and life in our sandbox is really good. We're paying the bills. Uh, we're feeding our bellies. We got a roof over our head and it's a pretty nice roof. At the end of the month, there's enough left over to have a little ice cream, play a little golf, take in a Broadway show, go on vacation, maybe even uh, two. We're doing pretty well. We're doing pretty well. And here's the challenge with doing pretty well. We have just enough to want just a little more. We have just enough to want just a little more. Let me make that personal. I have just enough to want just a little more. I have enough to have a little fun, which causes me to want just a little more. If you're looking to buy me a Christmas present, I got a list. Okay, just ask. All right, it's all you got to do. There are things I'd love to have. I cannot say like Paul, I have learned the secret of being uh, content. I can usually find something in any situation to complain about. It's a spiritual gift I have. <laughs> I've got nice golf clubs, but man, that new Callaway driver would probably find the fairway more often. My current driver goes right, it goes left. It's like a manufacturer defect. I don't know what's going on. Well, that thing, I, I don't get it. Um, I have a nice compound bow for bow hunting, but that Matthews bow is a little faster, maybe shoots a little straighter. Uh, you know, when we built our house uh, 17 years ago, I was so excited to have a two-car garage. <laughs> you know what I need now? No, four or five-car garage. Are you kidding me? That's so much junk in there. Uh, Anyway, not, never mind. We said, we said last week, you know what? Awareness is the biggest threat. It's the biggest threat to contentment. When we become aware of what's available, we're no longer content with what we have. When we become aware of what's available, we're no longer content with what we have. I will tell you, my biggest challenge sits right here. It's contentment for me. It's my biggest challenge. I am not finished in that area of my life. God is still working on me. And for years I'd read this verse and I think, you've learned the secret? Like, well, what is it? Why are you keeping it a secret, Paul? Why don't you tell us all? I mean, you're writing all this wisdom for believers and now you're gonna keep this a secret. I don't get it. What's up with that? And then it hit me, finally. It took a while. There's no secret to being content. Contentment is the secret. Being content is the secret. There have been times, this is my story, I don't know what your story is, there have been times where I have felt like my salary is too much. I, I should take less salary from the church. You know what that is? Discontentment. Doesn't sound like it, but that's what it is. It's discontentment. There have been other times where I've been anxious about college for my kids, about retirement, and are we gonna have enough? That's discontentment. I make too much, I make too little. That's a roller coaster ride, right? And if my mind is focused, if my mind is focused on whether I should give up some of my salary or whether I should ask the elders for a raise, my mind is not focused on the business of the kingdom. If we see every circumstance as an opportunity for self-improvement, we will always miss the opportunity for kingdom advancement. In other words, I'll be too focused on me to see what God's doing around me. And Paul says, hey, I, I know what it's like to be in need. That's a challenge. I know what it's like to have plenty. That's a blessing. If I'm well-fed, I'll take it. If I'm hungry, I'll accept it. If I have a lot, I'll take it. I won't think, well, I don't need this much. I'll take it. If I have little, I'll accept it. The secret is contentment regardless of the circumstance, positive or negative, because this is not about me. Right? This is not about me. It's about something so much bigger than me. If God gives me plenty, the question is, how do I honor him with it? If God gives me little, you know what the question is? How do I honor him with it? 
It's the same question. Regardless of how much or how little, it's the same question. How do I honor God with what I have? Now, we've talked about the lower story, upper story here uh, before. The lower story is all of the stuff that's happening right in front of me that I can see. Right? It's, it's my job. It's my family. It's my friends. It's all this stuff that's going on around me that affects me, that affects my world. The upper story is all the stuff that's going on above me that I cannot see. It's the story that's going on right now that's out of my sight, that's out of my control. And the upper story is the story of redemption that God is writing over humanity. It's God working behind the scenes in all things to work for the good of those who love him, as Paul says in Romans 8, 28. If God is, it's God working everything out for our good, even though, even though sometimes it feels really bad. It's God turning that job loss into opportunity. But in the lower story, all we see is loss. Right? The, the, the opportunity we only see in hindsight. And so the upper story can only be seen, it can only be seen and appreciated fully in hindsight. So these two stories are running parallel to each other and they are happening at the same time. Uh, But our lower stories, my lower story, your lower story is insignificant in light of the upper story script that God is writing over humanity. And so this is what Paul is saying. I've learned the secret and the secret is simply being content that I'm even in the story. The secret is being content that God has even chosen me to be in this epic story that he's writing. And so if God supplies me with much, it's to use for his glory to make much of him. And if he supplies me with little, it's to teach me dependence on him so that I can make much of him. But either way it goes, this is not about me. It is all about him and here's the thing if I move through life if I move through life believing that my story is the only story then everything is for me and everything is about me and here's kind of how that plays out if I have plenty then I'll think it's because I deserve it I outworked everybody else. I scratched and clawed my way to the top. Too bad for you. Good for me. I deserve it. It's all about me. And if I have little, I'll think it's because I got shafted. Life wasn't fair to me. See, if I only see one story, I have no context for contentment, no reason for gratitude, No motivation, no inspiration for generosity. But when my eyes focus on the second story, the upper story, suddenly my lower story has some context. It has purpose. And guess what? It's not about me. It's about something so much bigger than me that's going on. Which means, which means, I can be content that I'm even in the story. I can be content that God has chosen me to be a character in this epic story. Now, if you were in a small group a few weeks ago and you saw Rick and Karen Vogsberger's story and thought, how in the world could they just pack up and move to the Dominican to be missionaries? That's how. That's how. They are content simply to be in the story that God is writing. And you know what that does? That gives them freedom. Freedom to leave all this behind. And to go and serve the people of the Dominican to share the gospel with them. When we know this story is not about us, it gives us freedom. To do things that seem difficult and absurd Paul says God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. <laughs> right? Some people look at Rick and Karen and go, you're foolish. You're foolish to go on and sell your house even though you haven't raised all your support. God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. 
They're giving up the American dream to make the kingdom a reality for people who are far from God. And maybe you're thinking, man, I could never be that content. I could just never give up my career and move my family to a third world country. Well, Paul believes that you can if you're called. You can if you're called. So he goes on in 13, verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, this is the, the, the new revised NIV uh, version of this. You, you've probably memorized this verse or you've seen it on football players wearing eye black. You know, it says, I can do all things, all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so you thought this was about getting your one rep max at the gym. Right, you thought this was about training for your marathon, man, I can do all things through Christ. Listen, if you got that t-shirt, burn it. Because that's not what this is about. It's completely out of context and unrelated to what Paul is saying. I cannot bench press 400 pounds through Christ. I can't do it. I cannot dunk a basketball through Christ. I'll have you know, <laughs> I was able to do that in my teens and my 20s. Now, I wasn't doing a tomahawk and a 360, but I could dunk a basketball. And uh, that was when I weighed 140 pounds and could jump. <laughs> Neither of those are true any longer, okay? I'm going to have my fourth MRI in a few weeks, my fourth MRI in 14 months on four different body parts. <laughs> I'm falling apart. <laughs> I can't dunk on a seven-foot goal right now. It just wouldn't happen. But here's what I can do through Christ. I can give up some of my comfort and my conveniences because Christ, Christ strengthens me to make sacrifices for the gospel. I cannot do that on my own strength. It comes through him who strengthens me. I can think less about my future and give up retirement funds to bring the kingdom of God to the present to change the future for somebody else because Christ strengthens me to think about others' interests above my own. I can't do that on my own strength, but I can do it through him who strengthens me. I can learn to be content with what I have, whether it's a little or a lot, because Jesus strengthens me to seek his kingdom first, knowing that all things will be provided for me. I can't do that on my own strength. But I can do it through him who strengthens me. Rick and Karen can move to the Dominican, not because they're so awesome, which they are, not because they're so strong, which they are, but it's through Christ who strengthens them to lay down what's comfortable and what's known for what's uncomfortable and what's unknown. Paul says twice that he learned contentment. Contentment is not a spiritual gift. It's learned. It's a condition. It's a condition of life that is rooted in Jesus. And when we learn the ways of Jesus, when we learn the ways of Jesus and then practice the ways of Jesus, we learn contentment. We gain this secret. And when that happens, you will realize that what Paul says here is absolutely true, that you can do all things through him who gives you strength. See, what God calls you to, he strengthens you for. What God calls you to he strengthens you for, and, and here's what God is calling us to as a church. He is calling us to greater generosity. He is calling us to greater sacrifice, and he gives us the strength to make that happen. And Paul uses his own life as an example of how God has cared for him in every situation, large or small, and he goes on to remind them of this important truth of the gospel. In verse 14, he picks up on where he left off in verse 10, and their concern resulted in their financial partnership. He says this, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except only you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Now, Paul is showing us here the inseparable relationship between money and mission. Those two things are always joined 
together. You are a partner with every organization that you give money to because financial support is connected to partnership. We put our money towards the things we are passionate about, towards the things we care about. We invest money in things that we believe in. And so there are a lot of great organizations that you can give money to, but let me, let me just say this as plainly as I can. If you're not contributing financially to the spread of the gospel, you are not a partner with the gospel. And that has to change if you're following Jesus. See, if you give money to the Red Cross, you're a partner with the Red Cross to move that mission forward. If you give money to the American Cancer Society, you are a partner with the American Cancer Society to move that mission forward. And if you give money to Centerpoint, you are a partner with Centerpoint for the sake of the gospel to move the mission forward. And I'm all for giving money to good causes. Please understand, I'm not saying don't give money to good causes. I believe in what the American Cancer Society is doing. My dad died of cancer. It's a horrible disease. I hope they find a cure. Money helps that mission. But here's what we have to understand as Christ followers. There is a disease that is much more dangerous than cancer. It kills more than the body. It destroys the soul. Sin is what separated us from God and wreaked havoc on this world. Sin is the reason that cancer exists in our world. And the local church has a cure. Not for the symptom, but for the cause. The local church is God's rescue plan to share the cure with the world. And his name is Jesus. Every great cause that we give money to is a symptom of the effect of sin on the world we live in. And so I'm not saying don't give money to good causes. What I am saying is don't give to good causes and ignore the cure, which is the church. Every Jesus follower has a responsibility to partner financially for the sake of the gospel. And for all of you Jesus followers who call Centerpoint home, we're asking you to partner with us in this mission of loving God radically, serving others compassionately, and leading people to Jesus who can heal their soul. Partner with us in this vision of doubling our impact in this community to reach more people for Christ. Partner with us to finish the work on this campus. There is no greater cause, there is no greater mission than to partner with the mission of the local church to do the things God called us to do in this world. Now, this is always a challenge to talk about this subject because every week somebody is new. And last week, a new person walked out and said, man, that preacher wants money. And I get it. Because people in my position have abused the position and have taken advantage of people to move their own cause, their own agenda forward. But let me just be clear. I do not want money. I want the kingdom of God to come in this community. I, I, I don't want money. I, I want Jesus to be made known and lifted up in, in this community. I don't want money. I want to finish the work. I, I don't want your money. I want you on the journey of becoming a fully devoted disciple who makes disciples because that is all Jesus is counting. He's not counting your church attendance, He's not counting the dollars you're giving. He's counting disciples and disciples, fully devoted disciples, give up everything to follow Jesus because they know that following Jesus makes your life better and makes you better at life. So Paul goes on to list three things that happen when we give generously. Verse 17 says this, not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. Are you talking about my bank account, Paul? No, he's talking about your eternal account. When we give, we make an eternal impact. When we give, we make an eternal impact. Jesus said, don't store up treasure for yourself on earth where it gets stolen and 
Rust destroys it, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where it's never lost or taken away. Now, many of us have an IRA. We got, the, you know, an individual retirement account, and we're storing money away for our individual retirement, but just as important as our ERA, our eternal retirement account, where we're storing treasure away for eternity. We're making an investment in people's eternity. That's what happens When we give, we make this eternal impact that we'll never fully see the result of until we get to heaven. Verse 18, I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. See, when we give, we worship. Giving is an act of worship because it requires sacrifice. And when we give, we're saying, listen, God, you are the most important thing in my life. You're not a priority. You are the priority. You are above all things. You are first in all things. Nothing I want or need is more important than what I already have in my relationship with you. When we give, we reflect the heart of Jesus who gave everything for us. Our giving is an act of worship that brings honor to God. And it's not a have to, it's a get to. We don't do it to be saved, we do it because we are saved and because we want others to be saved. So we become a partner with the gospel. It's an act of worship on our part. In verse 19, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. When we give, we trust God. When we give, we trust God to provide for us. And this is a promise that is taught all throughout Scripture. It is not name it and claim it. It is give it and receive it. When we give, we open ourselves up to God's endless blessings. And the only way to guarantee that you'll never go without what you need is to give what you have. Your job can't guarantee that. It may come to an end. Anybody ever experienced that? Your retirement account can't guarantee that. It may run out before you do. My mom will turn 80 this year. Her 401k is almost empty. She'll outlive it. No doubt about it. Paul doesn't say that God will meet your needs according to your job or according to your checking account or according to your savings account or according to your retirement account. It's way better than that. He says he's going to meet your needs according to his riches. Do you know how rich God is? He owns it all. It's all his. It all belongs to him. It's never running out. His riches don't go up and down with the stock market. Amen? That's good news. And when you give generously to the kingdom, you guarantee God's endless supply for every need you'll ever have. That is the upside down kingdom of God. The world says, hey, make all you can, save all you can, and take care of you. But the kingdom says, make all you can, give all you can, and God will take care of you. And we said this last week, when God's kingdom is our priority, our provision is God's priority priority. He will take care of us when we seek him first. Jesus said it is better to give than to receive. And here's the thing about that. When we give, we receive. God will always meet your needs, whether they are financial or emotional or spiritual or relational. He will meet you right in the middle of your Need. That's what giving does. It opens up the door for God to pour out his blessings on our lives. Now, Justin and Stephanie Sims are a young couple in our church who have big faith, and many of you know them, but they made a decision a few years ago that God's kingdom was going to be first in their life no matter what. So I want you to watch their story. Hi, I'm Justin Sims. I'm Stephanie Sims. Um, We started coming to Center Point about four years ago when our second was born, and we went to a church um, that was about 30 minutes away from here um, for our whole lives, um, like 25 years or something. Um, But we just really wanted to be in a community 
uh, church community close to where we lived and so that we could serve there. Our children can go to youth group, you know, with the um, kids they went to school with. And so we just, we just decided to try it and we loved it once we started. So it's been about four years now. There has been just a ton of, I love like the, I love our dollar club that we do. I love all the mission oriented stuff that we do. Um, just even being with like student ministry and all of that. I just feel like um, Centerpoint does a really good job of making all of that known, like all the stuff that we're doing with um, like with the Dollar Club, with the donations, with the stuff that we've done with Pathway to Hope, all of that. I just feel like, I feel like it just has really shown that people are kind of like willing to step up and, and give to the different ministries that we support. And I love the videos that we've done and having, just being able to see all the different impacts that we're having around the community, I feel like has been cool to see people kind of step up and really start to buy in, I guess, not just, uh, or I mean, I guess with their money in general or with their time or whatever that might look like. Yeah, I think that we've had a lot of exposure just through the stuff we've done with the youth ministry and other things that we've tried to be intentional about getting involved with, and especially with the foster community as we've been getting involved with that more lately, seeing you know those opportunities and how the church is directly connected to a lot of different ministries that may not be a direct impact to that, uh, or they're not directly related, but they're very much alongside um, those ministries and um, being more aware of that kind of opens your eyes to that. And then every time as we do that, we're realizing more and more that like, hey, Center Point's a partner with that organization that we just heard about in one of our classes or or whatever that we didn't even maybe know about um, outside of all the stuff that we do talk about on Sunday. Coming into Center Point and um, getting plugged in and getting involved, we you know have four young boys, so we um, wanted to be very intentional about um, showing those kids how what serving looks like and being um, being involved and in, in helping others in the community. And and so we were intentional about doing these serving opportunities, and a lot of them were through the youth group or things that we led with our students. We uh, had started to serve, and we did, we went on this uh, thing at the father's house and got kind of the first taste or kind of first um, vision, I guess, into um, the foster community. And um, that pretty much changed the trajectory with four kids. We kind of started looking at our... Actually, it was three. Or, yeah, three kids, I guess, at the time. <laughs> it was three yeah, kids. at the time, three kids, <laughs> thinking three like, kids. you know, hey, we maybe still might want to have another kid, but we definitely, you know, have some room in our family. But there's such a need and there's such a um, massive need in our community directly here in our backyard you know of kids that you know need a home and need love and we were like well we have a home and we can provide love so let's start exploring that option and so that you know, I guess led to um, us ultimately getting um, licensed as foster parents. And in that process, we got pregnant and had another baby. And um, so there was a lot of spiritual growth in that of trying to find out like what's God calling us to. Like when we got pregnant, it was like, well, is this maybe a door that's closing or is this kind of just like a, hey, you just need a whole another level of crazy in your life and everything's gonna be great. Well, here's what I kept asking. If Tristan, our fourth, was a twin, we would figure it out, right? Like we would figure it out. So we just continued like on that on that journey and and yeah, like he said, I mean it was it was it was something where we would sit in service and if somebody brought up adoption or foster care or something, it would be like we'd stare at each other. That was the that was the thing that kept kind of nudging every time we heard it or saw a story on it, we would just stare at each other like, dang, this is something that's kind of stirring. And so, yeah, when we went to Father's house, I mean, they started talking about how they're just like 10 month old, two year old sleeping on the floor at the courthouse because there's just not enough families, especially with this drug epidemic, you know? And so we were like, we're a family. They need one, here it is, let's just go. And it was really that simple. I mean, it was more complicated than that, but it was really that simple. And I mean, we're we're open for placement right now and just waiting to just go nuts, I guess. I don't even yeah, know what see. that would even look like, but it's okay. Yep. <laughs> Without unpacking all of it, there was a day where um, we supported a, um, a nonprofit. It was called Africa Fire Mission. And um, they basically like provide safe fire things for people in Africa. Anyway, so we had supported them. They're friends of ours and they asked us that they were trying to send a container of stuff overseas and they needed $3,000 to do that. And I looked at him in our beautiful house that we lived in and I looked at him and I just said, I wish that like somebody could ask this of us and we could just don't even worry about it. You know what I mean? Like write a $3,000 check because in the grand scheme of things, like that's not that much money. I mean, it's a big chunk of change, but when we have a, when we have car payments combined of $900, like that's three months of car payment. 
that that started our get out of debt um, snowball, and which we did, and then that also started the whole process that had us sell our beautiful house and downsize almost a thousand square feet when we were pregnant with our third. Um, just to be able to get out of debt, have some margin, have whatever. Had we been in crazy debt, this foster care thing would have probably not happened. I mean, just the fact that we were available um, financially and in any other way, I feel like that's why we were able to say yes and how everything kind of unfolded. So as he was saying, like it's really cool to see and to back up to like those first decisions or those dominoes that kind of affected every, <laughs> everything and yeah. kind of landed us where we're at now. Mm -hmm. It's not just a, a spiritual discipline of like, I just, you know, have a direct deposit that automatically shoots money out of my account and I don't see it and I don't know it and I don't feel it. I think that it's a process to learn how to create margin and to adjust your lifestyle. And so we came uh, into this holiday season, we um, deciding whether or not, what was the right time to open our home? Cause we still had a very young uh, baby. Uh, so we were thinking, how do we get the routine down? He was figure like all of that out. Months. He's not sleeping through the night at all if they gave us another baby right now we would drown like we got to figure that portion of it out we are always going to have an excuse or something so we finally decided like look we're we're in a place we're gonna make the decision we're gonna open our home and that Monday we opened our home and that Thursday I was I let, let go from my uh, job so you know that's really easy to quite second guess that and go well is this a sign that we probably made a decision we shouldn't have or how are we gonna handle this and all those things but we had put ourselves in a position because we had been very intentional and very faithful and, and I guess uh, good stewards of our money that we could feel okay about that and losing a significant amount of income in a very short amount of time. Um, and so we chose to continue to trust that, you know, God's gonna provide. People in our community all around us, like immediately wrapped around us um, and were supportive with like, gifts and prayers and and uh you know people were dropping off gift cards like hey here's groceries for the week or hey how can we help and and what can we do to like get involved and, and help you guys out and that was a um something that we had been kind of practicing in theory for an extended period of time and then got to see in action for a, a short very crazy period of time um if i was going to encourage somebody that's on the fence uh about the unfinished initiative i would say uh, dive in i would say uh you know give god an opportunity to show off in your life um be vulnerable stretch yourself push yourself um you're going to get way more out of it than you're going to be giving to the process i, I promise you that when you get on comfortable it's going to be a blessing for you and your family we're ready to go you know what I mean the leadership team clearly has been spending time on this and they've thought through it they've prayed through it there's so much opportunity of growth in missions and um, outreach that we can do as, as long as we're all stepping up into this and coming in together as a community at center point and just moving forward kind of as a force and I'm, I'm really excited to see kind of where that goes And God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so it'd be easy to look at that and go, wow, you were so faithful to God and then God just let you lose your job. That's not God's fault. God's not the cause of him, him losing his job. See, it is a lower story, upper story. The lower story thing, that, that, that was just, that was difficult. That was hard. But what was God doing in the upper story two years ago? Preparing them for losing his job. By getting out of debt, by downsizing. God was going before them. Because God works in all things according to the, to the, to the good of those who love him. He works for the good in all things, for those of us who love him. And so God was going before them. God met their needs two years ago. And then he met their needs by having community come around them, their church community come around them, provide groceries, provide meals. God supplied their needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And you know why? Because they made a decision 
that God was going to be first in everything. Hasn't made their life easier, but it's made their life better. And it's made them better at life. Last night, about 200 people showed up at Lakota Fresh West Freshman Building for our advanced commitment night and to give their commitment early. And so next week is for the rest of us. Next Sunday is Commitment Sunday. It's the Sunday we're asking you to come and, and bring this commitment card with you, ready to, to give your commitment, your two-year commitment to this initiative. And the question that you need to ask God this week as you pray and seek discernment is, God, what does unfinished generosity look like? in my life? What does giving in a way that reflects that you're number one in my, in my life actually look like? What is that number? And what usually keeps us from radical generosity is that we don't actually know how it's going to work out. We don't have hindsight to see how it's going to work out. And I, and I said this last night to our folks at Advanced Commitment Night. If we had the hindsight to see how this commitment was going to change our lives, for the better, if we had the hindsight to know how this commitment will advance the kingdom of God, if we had the hindsight to know of the marriages that would be restored, of the addicts that would be set free, of broken people who would find healing, if we had the hindsight to know all of that, we would not hesitate in our commitment. In fact, we'd probably change our number. Hindsight is the ability to look back and see how the story unfolded and how God worked for the good in all things. And if we had the ability to see the ending of every decision we made in life, there are some things we do the same, but there's a whole lot that we do differently. And here's the encouraging thing about the God that we serve. A sacrifice made for his glory will never end poorly. God always, always, always rewards faithful generosity. And so faith is having the foresight that the hindsight will be a testimony of God's goodness. Faith is being able to see the end of the story before the story starts because we know that God is good and that God never fails us or forsakes us. There is no way for us to fail other than failing to trust God who has promised to meet all of our needs according to his riches in Jesus. And so the commitment that we're, that we're making next week is a commitment made in faith, which is having the foresight that the hindsight will be a testimony to how good God is. And we don't have to look any further to see how God, good God is than to a cross. The cross always gives us hindsight on every decision we make for the glory of God. If Jesus did not back out on your salvation, he will not back out on your provision. That's not who he is. And so when we make a sacrifice for God's glory, we can know that it will not end poorly, that God will do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. As we take communion this morning, it's a small piece of bread, a cup of juice that reminds us of the generosity of God through the giving of his son for our sins. As we sit at the foot of the cross, would you just ask God what generosity looks like for you, what unfinished generosity looks like in your life? Father, would you just speak into us in this moment and help us to know in light of your grace, in light of all you've given to us, what are we holding back from you? Help us to release that. In Jesus' name, amen.